What's up guys, it's Nurse Howie, CRNA Day Shadow 2. So certified registered nurse anesthetist and this is me talking about what it's like to be on, oh I'm sorry, this is day three, what am I talking about? What's up guys, this is Nurse Howie, and I'm talking about CRNA shadowing day three. Now CRNA, as you all know, is a certified registered nurse anesthetist, and we require, not we, whoever school I'm applying to requires usually around at least 10 hours of shadowing, but I'm going for 40 hours of shadowing. So now I am in my third day. Um, this was a shorter day. It was only about four hours, and I only saw about one, maybe two and of surgery cases for the day, and they were pretty fast. Uh, but I also noticed that a lot of the CRNA applications wanted uh, us to be able to see uh, general anesthesia. And for those, of know, for those of you that don't know, general anesthesia is when we completely put the patient to sleep and by we, meaning other people, not me yet. I'm hoping. So, at first, you know, if the patient's just having like a small surgery, like a, I don't know, like a quick block or something like that, we try to just make sure that the patient doesn't necessarily need general anesthesia. They don't have to go all the way to sleep because that comes with its own risks. You know, you have to put the patient to sleep, you pump them with a lot of medication, and then you shove a tube down their throat. Uh, you intubate them and then you monitor them and then you have to wake them up and that comes with its own slew of problems. So having general anesthesia is a little bit more difficult than just a regular partial block anesthesia. But of course those, comes, those come with its own complications as well. It's just that because if anything happens and the patient is just being partially anesthetized and then something happens like an emergency, uh, let's say the patient's crashing, they're too much in pain, or let's say the, just the patient needs to be able to, to go under anesthesia because the surgery is going longer. I think that general anesthesia would be the go-to anesthesia, you know, when a patient needs all these things. So let's, what am I saying? I'm saying is that general anesthesia is something that I should watch because it's done quite often it's like the default but it comes with its own risks so when a patient is put under general anesthesia usually they get consent and i think i talked about that with the previous days you can watch those videos here somewhere and uh, we talk to patients during the pre-assessment and if this if they're doing like a partial block then we say hey, so we're gonna do, we're just gonna anesthetize like one part of your body. But if anything goes wrong, then we'll do a general anesthesia, which means we'll put you completely to sleep so you don't feel any pain and you don't remember what's happening and we can operate on you further. Um, unless we already know that we're gonna put them in general anesthesia, we just go straight for that um, consent. But for the most part, usually we also consent for general anesthesia in case it is needed during an emergency if we're not already doing the general anesthesia. Am I talking in circles? I don't know. So one of the airways that I noticed that, that a lot of anesthetists have, because I follow um, a few, my mentor is great, she has lots of friends, and she, when she's not you know, following a case or she's not you know, um, undergoing a, an interesting case she thinks is, is interesting enough for me, she just tasks me off over to one of her peers. And it's nice to see different anesthetists have different styles of taking care of their patients. I'll talk about this in about day five or day six, but even though they have different personality styles, they at least have a certain way of taking care of their patient. They're always bam, on, you know, like they know what they're doing, they're quiet, they're intense, and they're focused, and they know exactly what needs to be done, where everything is, and what people need to do to help him or her to be able to get that great airway. 
So one of the airways that we talk about uh, involves people using a Mac 4, which is like this curvy blade. Again, I'm just barely an applicant, so I, I, I barely know anything. So I'm just telling you what I know, okay? Um, but feel free to correct me during the comments, like and subscribe. Uh, so the Mac 4 is around what they use for adults. And I asked, you know, what would people use a straight blade for when they're trying to put it, you know, keep the mouth open so they can vocalize, uh, I visualize the vocal cords through the epiglottis. And um, then they'll use a Miller blade for kids, but for the most part, a lot of CRNAs use a Mac 4. And I think a lot of paramedics too, you'll see a lot of videos on YouTube about that. But an LMA is more of a uh, laryngeal mask airway, I think it is. And it's kind of more plastic than metal. Well, well when we do the blade, when the TRNA does the blade and they insert the ET tube, or the anesthesiologist too, I also follow anesthesiologists, they, the, the endotracheal tube is a little bit stronger and a lot more durable. Whereas a LMA is more, it looks more like a spoon, like a giant salad spoon to me. It's pretty funny. I always kind of giggle to myself when I see it. Nobody hears me. I just kind of just smile in my mask, but it looks weird. And there's this YouTube video where this guy just swallows it. <laughs> it's so funny because it has a sexual component. But yes, it just goes right into the mouth and you don't need a metal blade for it. And um, I've seen it used a couple of times for patients who just need a quick general anesthesia or if it's an emergency and all the other airways aren't working. I'm not quite sure the advantages of using an LMA. All I know is that it's fast, quick, and easy, or it should be, and um, you should always have it nearby. So when they set it up, they use this acronym called Miss Maids, or Mrs. Maids, no, Miss Maids, because they would, the people who set up an airway to try to intubate a patient, you don't want to be looking for misplaced equipment. You want to be able to make sure that's there, 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 there. And if something's wrong, okay, well, there's my other backup equipment. There's my medications. There's my antidotes and reversal agents, yada, yada, yada. So what it stands for as a mnemonic is that they use this to get ready prior to bringing the patient into the OR room so they don't forget anything. Um, I, I know a lot, of, a couple of other anesthesiology and anesthetist videos show that they use this mnemonic too. So, so it's pretty popular. Uh, so M S Maids M S M A I D S M stands for machine. So you test it for leakage. Uh, I tried to read about how to test a machine for leak. It is really over my head. A lot of engineering that goes into it and a lot of ways that the gases can go and how you test it and you put your finger on a tube or something. Um, and then I talked to one of the nurse anesthetists about it and they said, well, basically now we have modern machines and they have, who tested me? We have modern machines and they just do the testing for us. So you just make sure that you run it, you turn it on. Sometimes when you turn it on, it automatically just does the testing for you. Oh my gosh, who is testing me? So check your machine, make sure it's working and there's no leaks. And then you want to be able to have your suction ready to go. If the patient, oh my God, who is texting? Where was I? Oh, so suctioning. A lot of people take a, the, the machine, the anesthesia machine has its own suction machine, but they usually like, take the tube and they tuck it underneath this little nook. And I don't think it's supposed to be there, but that's what everybody uses. So it seems like all the anesthetists and anesthesiologists all have the suction tubing right close to them uh, where they can just kind of grab it and pull it out within a split second. Then they monitor equipment. The very least, the patient has to have their EKG, pulse ox, uh, pulse rate, and the, heart, uh, the blood pressure on the monitor. That's normal. That's normal for like at least telemetry nursing to step down nursing to ICU nursing. Basically most of nursing except for medical surgical nursing involves a telemetry monitor because it really just shows you how the patient's doing, at least hemodynamically. Um, then they also, you know, I'd like to mention that the 
Apollo Draeger, which is an anesthesia machine that they were using, has a ventilator settings too. And you need to have those ventilator settings to be able to know when you're intubating somebody and you sedate them. Uh, you'll want to know when they stop breathing because you only have like seconds to be able to just put in that ET tube and then reventilate them so that you know that the machine is doing the ventilating for the patient because they're either very sedated and or paralyzed. Now, if your patient is paralyzed, of course they have to be sedated and of course you have to make sure that the patient pain is controlled. You know, just because a patient can't sedate themselves or can't be sedated um, does not mean that they're not in pain. And uh, God help you, if you paralyze somebody and you don't sedate them and you don't cover their pain meds, you are just a wicked, wicked, you probably go to jail, you know, because it's complete torture, really. So you need to be mindful of these things when you're taking care of your patient. You can't just dilly-dally and then forget about them and then not empathize how they're what they're going through. When somebody's cutting into their arm, their chest, their stomach, their legs and arms and all that stuff so you need to know and then oh also the apollo trigger machine also has a vapor setting so you can see exactly how much of the three main vapor gases that you're giving the patient uh, next is a as an airway tray a lot of the um a lot of the nurse anesthetists and the anesthesiologists like to set up at least their et tubes their lmas their injectable medications that they're giving, including propofol, lidocaine for propofol uh, because it irritates the veins, um, epinephrine, because um, when you intubate the patient, sometimes they, their blood pressure goes down, so you wanna make sure you give that. You wanna have um, your ANSEF ready to go to inject that, and you also wanna have your ephedrine ready to go in case, or neosinephrine in case the patient um, blood pressure is too, too low, and you wanna make sure it stays up. Next is, Oh, also, you, you also want to have your oropharyngeal airway. Um, when you're getting ready to intubate your patient during general anesthesia, you start off by putting a mask on them and then they wait. I think they wait until they're apneic, which means that they are stopped breathing. Then they shove in an oral uh, pharyngeal airway um, and then they start taping their eyes and getting the patient ready. And then when they're ready to get the blade, they take out the oropharyngeal airway, put the blade in, and then shove in the endotracheal tube, take out the blade, and then um, they hook up the endo, while somebody's holding the endotracheal tube, they hook it up to the ventilator, which is the anesthesia machine. And that's how you get your patient breathing while they're sedated and paralyzed. Um, and by paralysis, I mean like they gave them rocky rhodium in order to make the patient more relaxed and calm. Even though they're paralyzed, they could still be kind of like constricting their throat. So the rocky rhodium will paralyze them and it will relax them. Uh, next is IV and another set of what? I don't know. I should have, I don't remember. But IV, uh, usually patient, again, because their, their blood pressure is low, Anesthetists usually try to support their blood pressure by having an IV bag of lactated ringers, or I would say normal saline, but lactated ringers is a default that they use. And they have this big one liter bag and they hook it up to the patient where, you know, hopefully they've already had a working IV. If you don't, or they put it in the wrong arm, uh, then you have to insert the IV right there. So you should have good IV skills. And uh, once you have your IV, then you hook up the bolus, to the patient. Let me show you what it looks like, okay? All right, this is not the right type of, I got an IV pole, by the way. <laughs> uh, this is not the right type of tubing, but as you can see, this part is kind of a lure lock. I don't know if you can see that. See right there? And then you kind of just twist it, and that way when you shove it in uh, to the patient's IV, you twist it, and it goes over. Um, uh, that port so that it doesn't fall out of the patient. The IV doesn't fall out of the patient. Thank you, IV pole. Bye-bye. I want to use that for other videos, by the way. And I also use it as a coat rack. <laughs> when I'm not using it for anything else. So having an IV is good. Uh, you want to be able to keep that bolus open. And then while that, uh, usually they use gravity, so they just don't even use a machine. They just kind of let the bag drip down. Um, and while the doctor's 
you know, do the surgery, just drips, drips, drips into the patient so they don't stay, they don't become hydrated um, and they don't become too, too weak physically. And at the same time, when you're pumping them with medications such as, let's say, dexamethasone at the end of the case or Toradol for pain management um, or more ephedrine or more propofol if the patient's bucking the vent. We'll talk about that later. And you need to resedate the patient. Then you can just use the, come back here, Ivy Paul. <laughs> then you can just use, reuse the same um, tubing that you already have connected to the patient. And then, you know, instead of having to disconnect it, disconnect it, you can just use one of these stop cocks, okay? And then just close it off to the bolus bag. And this is open to the patient, me, like right here. And then you open up the top and that's where you put the syringe and you inject your medication, you close it back up and then you twist it right here, back up here so that it locks here, but then it continues, the, the bag of bolus continues through the tubing system. And um, that's how you give your medication without having to break the seraphiel, touch the patient, because you've already got a line somewhere and you're hanging out just out of reach of the surgeon so that you don't bother them and they don't bother you, but you can still access the patient's IV. Next is D for drugs. Drugs are and controlled medications. So again, I just talked, I already just talked about the drugs that they use a lot. Um, I know I have a list here. Oh, let me see. Yeah, so uh, some of the medications that I like, like to use is um, definitely Versed if the patient's anxious and then you want to start getting the patient more relaxed. Um, some of them give them give Versed at the um, surgery bay before bringing them into the OR. Um, and then some give lidocaine prior to giving the propofol for sedation because the propofol irritates the vein and lidocaine will keep it from becoming too irritable. And then you give your rocuronium to sedate, I'm sorry, paralyze the patient. And then at other times they give dexamethasone, undensetron, ketamine, excuse me, which is an MDA, an MDA receptor blocker. And it's an adjunct to opioid blocks, so you don't have to use too much opioids. Um, ephedrine for keeping the blood pressure up. Ketorolac, which is Toradol for pain management. Esmolol for blood pressure. And um, TXA, also known as cyclocapron, which I didn't know, uh, which is transexamic acid to help keep the patient from bleeding out too much. And NSF for um, antibiotics. You can also give hydromorphone, which is Dilaudid, uh, which is a strong opioid. Or fentanyl, which is also strong. Uh, but before you give the fentanyl, you want to make sure that your patient is breathing. Um, and Dilaudid as well, because they're opioids and they all retard your respiratory drive, your patient's respiratory drive. And there's also derivatives of fentanyl I, I saw, which is called like alfentanyl. Um, so that's, those are some basic medications. There's quite a few more. And the choice of what you make, of what medication to give is definitely dependent on your knowledge of pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, uh, pharmacobioavailability, stuff like that. And of course, reversal agents, because if you give too much, you want to be able to rescue the patient. Um, and these reversal agents will block, let's say, the opioids work on mu receptors, so you give a reversal. So if you're giving like um, Narcan, then it blocks the mu receptors. It acts, I think maybe that's a chelate, which clamps on to the opioids and then it takes it out of the body. So it reverses opioids from taking too much of hold of you. Um, or flumezanil for benzodiazepine, for benzos. Uh, next we have S, which is special equipment needed for a specific procedure. Uh, I don't can't think of too many things, but I do remember that when surgery or surgeons, I, surgeons are using lasers, we have to wear like glasses um, so we don't ruin our own retinas. Um, that's what comes to mind right now, but I'm sure there's quite a few others, but what do I know? All right, that's MS Maids, M-S-M-A-I-D-S. -S. Now the review is that it is a mnemonic for M machine. S is in suction, M is in monitor airway, A is an airway tray, I is an IV, and D is in drugs and controlled meds, and S is in special equipment used for specific conditions. Oh man, I am just rambling. <laughs> Let's move on. So 
Once you got MS Maids done, then you got your general airway or LMA where the airway is not guaranteed. So make sure that the mask is fully blown up with air. I'm gonna put a video of what an air, or a picture of what an LMA looks like, but it just looks like a big, big plastic spoon. <laughs> or an arrow or a spur. That's it. You decide. I'll just put a picture. And remember, at this time, your emergency setup should be, I already said that. Uh, have your emergency medications and reversals ready. I'll have a picture of a drawing that I made. I also do, took a video, um, but I can't show you, obviously. So I'll just show you a drawing that I made of what it looked like. And then my CRNA main mentor always says that if you're getting ready for um, an airway, even if it's not an emergency and even if it's routine, you should always have one up, one down, ready to go. And what that means is that you have your sizes of your ET air tube and your airway and your MAC blades and even your LMA or pharyngeal airways, all that ready to go, like one size higher or lower in case the patient is you know, bigger than usual or smaller than usual than you thought or just because the way they look on the outside, it's big or small doesn't mean that it's gonna be the same size inside their throat. So you wanna be able to have these things ready to go and have more and better options, uh, more options so you can have a better time of intubating the patient. Um, yeah, we had a uh, resident that was following um, my mentor, so she was kind of teaching both of us, but I was shadowing that the resident was actually learning and doing the, you know, most of the interventions herself, but she wasn't ready and she didn't have her airway ready. I don't know if she was just overwhelmed or she forgot, but my mentor was very angry at her because she something happened and the patient wasn't doing very well and the patient wasn't breathing. And when the resident went to go grab a tray or something from the tray to get a better um, visual and to be able to intubate the patient while well, the patient stopped breathing, also, Number one, she also forgot how to rebag the patient so you can re pre-oxygenate the patient. So even though they've stopped breathing, you can go back and put on the mask and then, you know, give them some extra oxygen so that when you take off the mask and replace it with an airway, uh, with an, you know, with a blade to put in the ET tube airway, they're not completely starving of oxygen. Well, she forgot how to do that too. So she did not have a very good day that day. Let's just say that she got kicked out. Um, but we'll talk about that later. Don't do that, kids. Remember, one up, one down, ready to go. Uh, so I tape. Uh, this is funny. A lot of anesthetists change their stuff around too. Sometimes they'll tape both eyes just like that, or just one 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 at a time, or they'll take the tape um, that they've already like ripped out. And then they'll touch it to their skin and then put it over their patient's eyes so that it wouldn't be that sticky. I don't know. It's just kind of funny how people add their own flair to it. But yeah, definitely tape the patient's eyes shut so it protects their cornea. Uh, then what else? So you turn on the monitor. So once you got the patient intubated, yay, and they're breathing fine. And we'll talk about this later, but there's, um, I say that a lot, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, so you check to make sure the patient has a CO2 because that is the gold standard of whether or not your patient is inside the lungs and not the stomach. Um, so the ET tube is inside the lungs, the airway is inside the air where it's supposed to be where there's air and not in the stomach. Um, that is a gold standard. Um, of course, you also have to you know check mist, listen for airway, and um, make sure the chest is rising equally. But definitely, definitely, definitely can't say that the tube is inside the patient uh, correct position unless you have a CO2 um, coming back as feedback. What else? Uh, so they turn on the monitor and. I'm sorry, let's go back <laughs> to oxygenating the patient. So you turn on the monitor. Sorry, let's do that. Ox reverse, reverse, reverse. Uh, the patient is in your bed and we have the airway tray ready to go. We haven't intubated the patient yet. You turn on the monitor. Sorry, see I told you I don't know this stuff yet. You turn on the monitor, that's what they did. And make sure the EKG leads are on, the pulse rate is going, the blood pressure is running and the oxygen saturation is good to go. Then you look over into your anesthesia machine, the Apollo Draeger, and check to make sure that you've given enough um, um, 
either IV sedation or vapor sedation, usually like SIVO or ISO fluorine. And uh, your EXP is over 80% and that the MAC is around 1 to 1.3. Uh, we'll talk about MAC later. Ah, there it is, I'm saying it again. And um, then you pre-oxygenate the patient once you have the monitors on. You have your airway tray set ready to go. And the patient's in front of you and you're right there at the head of the bed. You pre-oxygenate the patient again, so make sure the EXP on the top left is over 80%. That means that the patient is oversaturated with oxygen so that when you take off the mask to help them breathe, um, then they can hold their breath longer. It doesn't make them uncomfortable because they're already sedated, but they're still not breathing. So you have to make sure that you do what you need to do to get into that airway before the patient stops breathing and also not giving enough oxygen. Uh, then you start your sedation with either propofol and your vapor, and you check to make sure that the patient, again, is checking, is getting into that MAC 1 or 1.3. Don't quote me on this. Remember, I'm not even a student yet. And then you paralyze with rocuronium or any other paralytic that you choose, depending on the patient's electrolytes, I believe. I think that if the patient has bad potassium, or if it's too high or too low, then you want to stay away from rocuronium or you want to use propofol completely. I'm not sure. Somebody tell... I'm mean, sorry. That's, propofol is not a paralytic. It's a sedative. Uh, succinylcholine. Succinylcholine. Um, and then if you end up needing to intubate with ETT instead of just LMA, definitely want to use that rocuronium paralytic or succinylcholinesterase, which we uh, uh, abbreviate as SUCKS. I don't know if you guys watch Chicago Med, but you'll see a lot of emergencies where the doctors take, them, take patients that are having difficulty breathing. They're like, give me 20 of a and 100 of sucks or whatever. <laughs> uh, don't quote me on those doses. So then you insert your airway. Um, you test the... Uh, oh, I don't know why it says test the cornea, but definitely insert the airway. Take that MAC4 blade. <laughs> I don't have anybody else to show you the example. You shove it in there. You kind of lift it up. Of course, your patient head, while on the table, should already be tilted up, and then the chin should be lifted. So you should lift the chin towards you, not the, the blade towards the chin. Chin towards you. And then the blade is here. And like, imagine my hand being whoever the anesthetist is. Sorry, Remy, that's my dog. And then you kind of lift it up so that you can have a better visualization of the epiglottis and through the epiglottis, the vocal cords. And sometimes they have the OR circulating nurse push down cricoid pressure at the exact location that they want it. Um, usually they'll push it down themselves and they say, okay, I want you to press down here and never let go until I tell you to better able to visualize the vocal cords. Um, and then you apply the, the eye tapes and then you reoxygenate again, but this time using the ventilator and not the, the bag mask. I had the bag and the mask on the machine. And then you verify placement by checking the ETCO2. See, I went ahead of myself, but if there's confirmation from the um, FICO2 monitor in the Draeger, then you know that you're really uh, probably most likely in the airway. Now, usually when they do that in the regular nursing floor, even an ICU nursing floor, we still verify it with an x-ray, but you don't have time to do that during the OR and they're not going to do that. So the FICO2, which is a CO2 monitor, is your gold standard of knowing that you're actually in the patient's trachea. Okay. Um, but of course, also double check to make sure there's mist in the tube and it's disappearing and that there's bilateral breast sounds and that there's equal uh, uh, chest and expansion, uh, rise and expansion of the chest. And then unless the patient is ventilated, the amount of FiCO2 is irrelevant, but the presence of the waves of CO2 is very important. Uh, similar to making sure that the mist disappears to um, emphasize that the patient is breathing in and out the FiCO2 doesn't, it's not good enough when you see just FiCO2 and it's just a flat wave that just goes on and on and on. It has to be like a wave that kind of ebbs and flows up and down, up and down, up and down. 
All right, the next discussion is rapid sequence intubation. I thought I knew what this meant, but I, apparently I don't because when we were hanging around at the office, we were talking about rapid sequence intubation and the SRNAs, which is a, of CRNA students, and our men, their mentors were like, well, you know, there's a little bit of a debate between rapid sequence intubation. I remember making a YouTube video or a video about rapid sequence intubation, and it was through the perspective of me as an ICU nurse in the COVID unit that we were having to try to rapidly intubate somebody. So to me, that was rapid sequence intubation from my perspective as an ICU nurse. But to them, which is the anesthesiology team, rapid sequence intubation involves a completely different thing. So number one is the point is to try to stack all odds in your favor to maximize the ideal patient outcome. Now you can say what rapid is, um, and you can say how many minutes or whatever, or seconds, but nobody really has a standard to say, hey, okay, that was less than 30 seconds, that was rapid. No, rapid is as fast as you can get that airway into the patient, um, hopefully in one try or, you know, at least a minimum amount um, to increase the patient outcome. And then you should do it within I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm just gonna contradict myself. But generally, there's no standard of time, but you really should do it within one minute. So there's no need this time for pre-ventilating the patient, checking to see if the FiCO2 is over 80%, um, blah, 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 blah. There's no time for that. If you hear, by the way, if you hear chewing or clickety-clacking, that's my dog down there, and he's just like, I give him a treat. Uh, so there's no need for pre-ventilating the patient. I mean, there is a need and you want to pre-ventilate the patient, but you can't because it's an emergency. Um, then there's also no need to wait the three to five minutes for the rocky rhodium to take effect because again, you, again, you just don't have that luxury. Uh, precautions include always assuming that the patient has a full stomach because again, there's an emergency. Usually the patient didn't have a full 12 hours overnight to fast prior to coming into the OR. Let's say they have at least a, a, a burst appendix or some kind of a trauma where they needed to be intubated right away and sedated right away. Um, we also want to, uh, so you want to assume that they have a full stomach. So if they do throw up and, and get nauseous, you want to get ready with that suction, of course, to make sure that you can suction the airway in case a patient throws up on you. Because um, throwing up completely, completely, not completely, but like usually destroys a lot of your airway and you have to really clean it up there in order for you to try again. And then do you use cricothyroid pressure? I remember when I talked earlier about how some CRNAs and nurse anest uh, anest anesthesiologists will want to try to push down on the airway, on the trachea to be able to get a better visual. Um, that's kind of a debated issue, uh, but you know, they say that if it works, use it. And if it doesn't, then don't. So some say it prevents reflux, and uh, one of the student RNAs, CRNA, SRNAs talked about a burp procedure, uh, which regards to an easier visualization, but I, I have to look that up. Then some push, whereas others say it's only necessary just to pinch uh, the trachea. And also administer crack pressure before you administer the propofol, because once pressure is applied, do not remove until the CRNA instructs you to. And no BVM bagging is needed because again, you're not pre-oxygenating the patient. So why bag them? And hopefully that you finished Remy. He's bored. So hopefully you finished putting in the airway, but if you failed, then that's a problem. A lot of stress. And I think that's where we get the reason why we get paid so much or why they get paid so much. Um, insufflation is something that you really want to watch out for unless you're, unless you're purposely trying to do it, which is the pr insufflation is a process of forcefully inserting gas in order to better visualize the organ area for, let's say, laparoscopic procedures. Um, but you don't want insufflation if you're trying to intubate the patient um, and then you're just kind of like blowing up their stomach with gas because that could probably uh, cause uh, nausea or vomiting. And uh, an OGT, which is an orogastric uh, tube, and Foley, along with insufflation, help to increase visual visualization of the organ system. Sorry, <laughs> that's Remy playing with his favorite toy, which sounds like a plastic bag. And then we never use LMAs for RSI, because again, LMAs are only temporary, and they're plastic, and they're flimsy. 
um, and we want a good airway for a patient that is in, in mucho, mucho distress. That's much, a lot of distress for you non-Spanish speaking people. <laughs> so BIS monitors, which is a bispectral index spectrometer, I'm a, I'm a sensor. Monitors should have one to two twitch for a train of four. Uh, you can probably look up a lot of videos on ICU um, nursing about using twitch monitors to uh, visualize uh, patients who are paralyzed and see how deeply paralyzed they are. There's a little hint though, is that they're not super duper accurate, but it's better than nothing. Next, we're gonna talk about the APL valve. All right, now we're gonna talk about the APL valve and this little valve contraption has confused me to no end. Just looking up on Wikipedia and it says that the adjusting pressure the, I want to see what it means. Okay. All right, the adjuster adjustable pressure limiting valve is an adjust is commonly abbreviated to APL and also referred to as an expiratory valve, relief valve, or spill valve. is a type of flow control valve used in anesthesiology as part of a breathing system. It allows excess fresh gas flow and exhaled gases to leave the system while preventing ambient air from entering. Now this is important because we wanna be able to introduce vaporized gas into the patient um, and also give them um, a certain amount of oxygen and um, air that we want to give the patient. And then we want to release the gas, but we don't want to release the air to go along with the gas because we want the oxygen to stay with the patient and the CO2 and the extra um, vapors of anesthesia, uh, the extra anesthetic vapors to leave. So we want to leave, have all the waste leave, but not the oxygen and the, um, the gases that we want to, to stay. Uh, but uh, my mentor talked about it and then maybe I'll, I'll with their permission, I'll post it on YouTube. But it was it was pretty uh, complex, especially when they're talking about a Jackson Reese circuit. And I really need to read up on that. But as an incoming student, app, app, you know, applyee, it's really hard to understand what that means. And damn it, Remy, <laughs> you're so loud. I'm sorry. He's just too cute for me to kick out. So hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, the microphone is on. And then you want, you want to mind the rate. You don't want to completely expel all the gases quickly, too quickly. And then the Jackson Reese depends on supplemental oxygen. And I guess you can give supplemental oxygen. And then when the patient is spontaneously breathing or allowed to, in, allowed to spontaneously breathe in the vent settings, usually it's in SIMV. Um, we'll talk about vent settings later again. APL should be wide open, which means it should be a zero centimeters. Um, but also don't forget to, con don't confuse that when you're bagging the patient, don't, don't bag the patient greater than 20 centimeters per of, of water. So start to finesse the APL valve as the patient becomes sedated, then start to close gently to help assist the patient with breathing. And it has a similar function to pee, but I'm not advanced enough to, to be able to explain that to you. All right, finally, things I wanna know more about. Lastly, here are some of the things I wanna know about uh, and read about more from today's lessons. Uh, dermatomes and their anatomical landmarks, uh, usually when patients aren't being generally anesthetized. Don't forget there's a preference for not being generally anesthetized because it leads to less consequence and risks, but it also has risks of, it own, of its own because when you anesthetize a certain part of the patient's spine, um, then you're hoping to paralyze or at least anesthetize or temporarily paralyze just a certain part of the body. And so a good key landmark is uh, umbilicus is around T10 and uh, xiphoid is around T4, um, but I need to verify this. But these landmarks are important when you're assessing partial blocks because you want to make sure that the anesthesia isn't traveling up to the diaphragm, um, thus affecting the patient's breathing. And I also want to know about ASA categories. These are corresponding to the acuity of a patient and their readiness for surgery and successful outcome. This is a simple view. So let's say it's just a classification so that anesthesiologists and surgeons can speak the same language about how severe the patient is. So 
it goes from P1 to P6 and E, which is a new category. So P1 is a tight control of the airway and it's good health status, basically a healthy patient. P2 is loosely controlled. The patient has some kind of other comorbidities or just not, maybe they're very anxious. Um, P3, patient has significant comorbidities. Let's say they have like lung problems or heart problems that affects daily life but doesn't stop it. So a lot, what comes to mind, number one is like patients with um, mild, moderate heart failure. They usually have HEFPEF, which is like heart failure that is with preserved ejection fraction, which means that their heart has a pump volume of at least 40, 50%, okay? Um, and then P4 is where a patient has incapacitating comorbidity that should be addressed now, as in like today. And P5 means that the patient needs surgery in order to live. So to this comes to mind a lot of cardiac surgical procedures or um, um, let's say cancer resections uh, that's blocking the patient's organs from functioning um, in order to keep the patient alive. And P6 is a patient is brain dead. Basically, they're just harvesting the organs. It sounds very morose and morbid, but there is a certain category where you, that's how we harvest organs in order to give it to other people that are also deserving um, and that the patient has honorably chosen to donate. And that gives me chills because I have been on some, um, and some, um, they, they put it up on the overhead and I've had patients that have died, but they were organ donors. So immediately the family said yes, because it's so hard to ask the families right away. Thank God I don't have to do it. It's hard to ask the families. I'm sorry. It's hard to ask the families right away to give a piece of their family members that just died to somebody else. And so we honor that by staying, standing in line in the hallway as the patient is brought to the operating room so that we can harvest their organs. So usually a lot of hospitals will honor this. Jeez, where is this coming from? <laughs> Moving on. Um, e is an emergent patient in need of surgery ASAP. So again, like burst appendix, tr we're talking just trauma, emergency patient. What I saw was like a patient's appendix burst and they were completely in septic shock, but um, it's hard to determine that between um, P5 and, and E, except like patient is just gonna die, like not just today, but like right now. And anyways, um, the next thing I wanna know is about post-operative nausea and vomiting. How can we mitigate this for patients after surgery? I'm learning more about this in the subsequent days of shattering. Oh my God, why am I still tearing up? And usually POMV is triggered during the car ride home. I gotta stop moving. <laughs>